thank you for joining us for this program. It's Red Deer Public Library with the voice of Albertans with Disabilities. We're having a panel discussion to celebrate the International Persons with Disabilities Day, which is on December the 3rd, and today is December the 1st, so we're, we're going to um, celebrate it today and continue celebrating for the next three days. Um, this particular discussion is going to talk about uh, universal design. So we're going to ask the panelists to, in a moment, introduce themselves. And then we're going to ask you a few questions about your own lived experience as a person with disabilities um, through the lens of the seven principles of universal design. And we can talk about more of that as we continue in the program. My name is Kim, and I'm here with Tatiana Tilly of Ridger Public Library. And we will be recording this, and it will be uh, closed captioned. And uh, part of our preparation for this program was actually adding that accessible feature, which is not always used at all meetings. So. That's you know a learning experience we started with this this um, meeting. So um, I will turn to the first person on my left on the panel. If you can just mention you know your name, what brought you here today, and uh, what in particular you're celebrating on on this day. And that I think that's me. Um, hi, my name is Michelle Bissell, and I'm the education coordinator for Voice of Albertans with Disabilities. And what brought me here today was uh, I wanted to do something for International Day of Persons with Disabilities, and Tatiana and I have been in contact for several months setting this up now. So I'm excited to be here. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah. Tara, would you mind doing an introduction? You're on mute, Tara. Sorry about that. That's my famous move. Um, <laughs> my name's Tara and I'm in Chile, Edmonton today. Um, I have multiple hidden disabilities. Um, and I'm here today to celebrate this wonderful day that is, I guess, multiple days of the Day of Disabil Persons with Disabilities. And thank you so much for inviting me, Michelle. Mm -hmm. um, Michelle is with Voices of Albertans with Disabilities, and it's a wonderful organization. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tara. Roxanne. What brings you to this celebration? Hi, uh, well, I'm a volunteer with Voice of Albertans with Disabilities. We give presentations to the public like we did for you the other night. Um, yeah, and I mean, I'm here because Michelle asked me, but I'm very happy to be here and certainly a day worth celebrating. So thanks. So I believe that that particular program was recorded, wasn't it, Tatiana? And it is on the website already. So it's already uploaded to the Red Deer Public Library website, www.rdpl.org. If you missed it, that presentation can be viewed at any time. So Heath, would you mind telling us a bit about yourself and what brings you here on this cold day? Uh, hi, my name is uh, Heath Burkles. I go by the pronouns he, him. I uh, live in the uh, Edmonton area. And uh, yeah, what brings me here? Um, well, for one thing, I'm uh, I'm in well have been involved with radical inclusion, and it kind of got me an invite to uh, find out about all this going on here. And uh, yeah, so. Um, Sorry, what was your other questions? Um, also, uh, what what you're, you already mentioned that you're part of radical inclusion, which we want to hear more about. Um, your name, which you were good with, 
And then just, you know, anything else that you want to share with us about what you're celebrating on this day with us? Just everything about um, the, the way that we've continued to move forward with things in the disability community. Uh, it has been really hard almost all the time, and, but um, just the continuing energy to keep going forward, even when we don't really have the energy for it. Um, and the amount of care for uh, supporting each other on the way. Thank you, Heath. I'm glad that there has been care on the on the way. So um, Donna, would you mind sharing just um, a bit about yourself and what brought you here today and what you're celebrating? I am Donna, and I'm also a part of the radical care of, of BAD. Um, I just want to recognize this day because I think it's an important day, and I think it's it's a wonderful day for us to be able to get our voices out there and heard and and to bring attention to some problems that need to be, some issues that need to be resolved. And um, I honestly believe that people living with disabilities have the right to being treated with dignity and being allowed to have a say in their own lives. And right now, I think sometimes that doesn't happen so much. So um, yeah, I'm so much excited to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Donna. Lisa? Sorry. Um, my name is Lisa Bennett. Uh, I, I apologize if my internet's not very good. Uh, I'm having some issues over here. Um, but uh, my name is Lisa Bennett. Um, I'm originally from Hinton, but I've lived in Edmonton for almost 10 years now. Um, and what brings me here is I'm a volunteer with Voice of Albertans with Disabilities and also radical inclusion and um, being a person with a disability myself, um, anything, anything related to advocacy for the disability community is near and dear to my heart. Thank you. I know um, one of the frustrations for someone with disabilities is technology. And though it's good, um, we're able to have closed captioning for this. I noticed that when you um, said uh, the voice of Albertans with disabilities, it it scrambled that. So someone will will be wondering what what group you're part of. <laughs> So Ian, could you share with the group um, what you're celebrating and uh, what brings you here? Any of you know your personal experiences that um, bring you to this group in particular? Yes, thank you. My name is Ian Young. I reside here in Edmonton, Alberta. I am not with the Voice of Alberta's Disabilities, but I was a former board member and advisor. I now sit on the Canadian Council of Disabilities on the executive board. Um, I was not born disabled, but I became disabled 18 years ago. So I would have to say it was a whole new world opening for me. There's things I've never seen before. But what I've seen most in the past 18 years is resilience and going forward. And uh, it's a, yeah, it's a new world. Things change every day. They change because of us, because of the ones we uh, inform. Because, uh, you know, I never knew how disabled people lived before I became disabled. And it's uh, fascinating. It's very, and it should be celebrated because uh, the people in this on this call should all be recognized for the hard work that they do. And uh, yeah, yeah, celebrate for a while. Look at our other peers and see what they're doing. And all celebrating coming together to, uh, 
make a big cause more even useful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Sam, would you be able to share with us what you're celebrating? Absolutely. So I'm Sam. I am currently not disabled, but know that can change at any moment. Um, so I am here as the Provincial Accessibility Coordinator for Voice of Albertans with Dis Disabilities. Um, and I believe Michelle asked me to join you all today just because um, doing some accessibility work, I have some intimate knowledge of the universal design and those types of things. So a different lens maybe, but um, yeah, I am here to celebrate. I think IDPD is, um, it should be more than one day and I'm glad that we're doing this ahead of time. And I, uh, I think that it's just a good jumping off platform for, you know, setting intentions and work and what we need to do to continue because as everyone else on this call said, we're, we still have a long way to go even if we've come so far as well. Thank you so much, Sam. Um, while you were um, sharing that with us, um, Murray Rodas from the um, Access for Disabilities group in the Red Deer area just walked in. So I'm going to ask him if he's comfortable with sitting with me for this panel discussion. Sure, we have a chair right there for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to move over and give him some space. Uh, actually, by chance, Murray was um, in the library doing an audit. He is actually a um, certified Rick Hansen facility auditor, and uh, he was going through the facility. So I think he probably brings some, some more to this discussion, which um, if I can force him to come sit down and, and be part of this panel discussion, I'm, I'm sure we're gonna add him to the group, right? Murray was an advisor on our board too, so <laughs> we know Murray. So you actually um, are, are a tight community then? Do most of you know each other? We all know each other actually on this panel. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah we sure do. We all work together at some capacity. So whether it be radical inclusion or uh, part of my presentation team or both. Okay. So I have a few questions and I'm going to, if, if it works for the group, just uh, pose a question to one of you. And if you would like to um, add to that, then we can go through everyone to have a chance, or if you want to pass on that question and take the next question, would that work as a format for everyone? Yeah. Good? Yeah. So my first question, and we can all think about it before I pose it to anyone, is who benefits from accessibility? Before I pose the question to one of the panelists, I want to share something that um, is, is my experience. I am not at this time uh, facing a disability that affects me. However, I um, had a conversation with someone who was disabled and we were talking about accessible innovations and accessible features. And, uh, and we were talking about um, using them. And this person said, uh, if you come up to a building and there is a uh, an access button and you use it because your hands are full or you're, you have a struggling child that you're holding on to, in that moment, you are disabled and that accessible feature is benefiting you. It's not as though you can't use that because you have to be someone who is in a wheelchair or someone who has a visible disability. And I really appreciated that, that accessible design really does benefit everyone. And I have seen many people who have come up to you know that particular um, button and it has saved them in that moment because I think that's something to keep in mind is that um, everyone is disabled momentarily <laughs> And, and accessible design helps them for that. So, Michelle, do you want to answer this question for us? Sure. Um, 
who benefits from accessibility. Just like you said, absolutely everyone and anyone can benefit from that accessibility. We have a slide in our presentation that says disability covers every demographic. So if we make improvements for people with disability, we make improvements for every demographic. It doesn't matter who you are. Would anyone like to add to that? Tara, do you have anything to add? Um, like Michelle mentioned, um, making changes for accessibility for persons with disability can affect everyone. It can be the senior citizens, it can be the individual with a mother, like a child. Um, it could be an individual who possibly has a broken leg or a broken arm and can't ha, uh, can't mobile, like, I'm sorry, tongue tied tonight, uh, has mobility challenges. Um, and little changes can affect people who are not, how would you say, permanently disabled. So making adjustments in accessibility and inclusion can affect other groups in a positive way. Thank you. I'm going to ask this question of you, Murray. Well, I agree with everyone so far because actually, uh, ultimately, accessibility is based on universal design. Universal design is called universal, so it's accessible by everyone. Yeah makes everything easier. I think uh, lots of people think that accessibility has to be onerous or costly. And actually, if, uh, if we were to think about accessibility from the outset of creating an environment, we would find that adding accessibility is not really as costly as it appears. Lots of times, even in buildings, uh, to get uh, an accessible facility, it may not cost you a thing as long as you get at it and you focus your your uh, your design towards inclusion of everyone. Um, you'll find that uh, it actually doesn't cost any more, and you don't actually lose much space. And overall, more people are able to access the facility, so therefore, more people are willing to pay probably more money as well to get into that site. So oftentimes. You know, from a builder standpoint, this is a good thing. So, I, I I often I'm often confused when I hear that, you know, who who will who will actually benefit from this? You know, they lots of business owners say, I don't understand why I need to try to be accessible more than I am right now. And my comment to them is this: that with 20 some percent of the population of Canada identifying as having a disability, if you eliminate 20% of your population coming through your doors, you're effectively giving everyone else a 20% discount. Um, you're losing 20% of your profits and um, you know, include everyone, increase your profits, um, just make everything more inclusive. So the nice thing about inclusion is that if you are a person with disabilities and you happen to wander into a, any facility, you can expect to get in and enjoy it as anyone else. And I think that's uh, really the whole essence behind it. But ultimately, accessibility, it helps everyone. Um, Roxanne, I'm gonna ask you the next question. How would you define inclusive and or universal design. And if you wouldn't mind sharing an example, inclusive spaces for people, how or what would make a space inclusive for everyone to use? Well, <laughs> no, I didn't. Um, I mean, it's already really been said, so I just don't want to repeat what everyone else has said. Um, but the first, just to give you a personal example, I competed in, um, I was a Paralympian and one of our trips was to Europe and we went to um, like a lake resort. And 
from the outside, you would not have known that it was universally designed. And probably somebody without a disability wouldn't even have known that. It was so well designed and so included in the design that unless you needed those features, you probably wouldn't even know they were there. And that just, that's what actually, like, that was one experience that has made me advocate for the last 20 years, because I had been in another country that, that really committed to the process and, and designed in a way from, you know, from the beginning, rather than, you know, looking at it after the fact and saying, oh, well, now we need to make, you know, add a ramp and now it looks ugly, you know, but if you, you commit to the design process, you don't even know it's there. Um, so there's a lot of benefits to that, you know, to get our um, builders and developers to look at it from the beginning, rather than after the fact, then having to make adjustments to their lovely designs. So that's just some, you know, what I have to say. Ian, I hope you don't mind. I'm going to ask the same question of you, because you have a perspective of having um, a disability that you're just um, experiencing later in your your life. So you've had both experiences, the experience of walking into a building without um, needing any accessible design. And um, now I'm assuming there are some times when not having an accessible design has been a frustration for you. Can you share any mm -hmm. examples um, from your own lived experience of you know, when universal design is has worked for you and when it hasn't? I always, yeah, that's very, it's a very interesting question. I, and coming from my perspective, uh, I think it's better when a universal design is a group, when they come to a community like this or people like us who are living with disability, instead of just guesstimating, or, you know, guessing what we'll want. Like for instance, in Edmonton, I use a four wheel walker, that's why I get around. So ramps are very uh, touchy for me because uh, we have one city of Edmonton property that takes you to a rapid transit right in the downtown. It's a huge ramp and it's so steep. I'm terrified to go down it. I have to press my brakes on my walker all the time and move very, very slowly. <laughs> they can get very busy at times. So if they consulted people who were actually living the life, it would help and it opens more doors. And people sometimes forget the more accessible places become, they forget that we're consumers. So it is a advantage to uh the cost of, to uh, their their business and everything for consumers. And other things I've seen like when Roxanne said, I have seen just the smallest things have fascinated me. I went to a grocery store that was recently built in Edmonton over three years ago. They had an accessible washroom. It's not a stall in a washroom, it's a whole separate, separate washroom where you have everything is push button. There's cords there to call for emergencies. But I often look at those stalls and say, how could somebody who needs an assistant to take them out of their chair and seat them on the toilet get in there They're so small? Or how could a wheelchair get in there? Because I have problems with a walker getting in there. This bathroom, you could bring seriously about eight people in there. And I just thought, well, I'm getting excited about a bathroom, <laughs> but yeah, it's just, uh, when you see good ideas, share them. When you see uh, bad ideas, don't complain about them, just make a suggestion. And we can do it with a kind, friendly way. Um, and yeah, things can get done. This this group of people, I'm not in a medical conclusion, but all of them here are uh, very heroic to me, especially Roxanne. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. You do have a good perspective and it. You, you have been able to share how um, accessibility and our attitudes towards it sh changes over time. Um, does anyone else have anything that they want to add to that? How maybe your attitude to accessibility has changed over time? Donna, do you have anything you want to share? Actually, it kind of it kind of goes into the next question a little bit as well, and that is, I find I'm not like what I would consider a senior yet, <laughs> although I have gotten a discount at Sotheby's before, which is kind of cool. Um, but no, I'm not a senior yet. But I do find I don't have the energy 
that I had when I was younger. I'm a, I um, use a wheelchair uh, and I don't have the adventurous um, attitude that I once had. If, if I wanted to pop up off a curb, I would do it when I was younger. Now I'm kind of scared I might fall or I might injure myself in some way. So my approach to accessibility has changed somewhat. And I find I tend to use um, more of the accessibility options available to me. When I was younger, I would probably open that door myself just out of spite. <laughs> but now I kind of want to preserve my shoulder because I need to be able to transfer still for several, hopefully several years. So I use that button a lot more often. Um, that's probably one of the things that is, that's changed the most is now I am, I'm seeing life as with a little bit more of a senior lens, <laughs> so to speak. Thanks for that. I think, I think we're all aging. <laughs> so I think, uh, our, our need for accessible, um, design will change too. And as, uh, as Ian mentioned as well, uh, life happens and things can change very quickly. You may not have time to adapt. You may really need to have um, someone thinking that through for you so that whatever you're transitioning to in your life is going to be easier. Sam, do you wanna add anything to that? Any way perhaps your approach to accessibility has changed over time? Yeah, absolutely. Um, when I came into this business, I falsely assumed that I hadn't had any interaction with people with disabilities beforehand, or if I did, they were acquaintances. Um, I think there's a lot of um, misconception, especially about hidden disability, even if they're mobility challenges, like there's obviously like mental and cognitive disabilities as well, but um, there's a lot of folks, and you'll hear this all the time when somebody has a placard and they park in the disabled parking spot and someone says, you're not in a wheelchair, you don't need that. And there's some kind of like pushback and it's like, you don't really know what's going on. And maybe they're not using a mobility aid today because you know they're having a good day or what have you. So um, uh, my perspective has changed a lot. And I kind of wanted to come back to maybe the first question a little bit about um, who benefits from um, accessibility. And like, as somebody, um, in this business, like when we turn caption, I use captions all of the time in Zoom meetings because I find that my, you know, spending all my time online, my attention span, working, like I can find that sometimes I'll, my mind will start wandering and it's like the captions really help ground me. Um, I use screen reader technology to read really dense articles to myself because I'm like, I find myself not being able to follow them anymore. And then of course, like the curb cut effect of, um, you know, they put curb cuts in for people with disabilities, but now cyclists love it, strollers love it, delivery people love it. Like there's just, um, even like texting started as um, a way for people to communicate, people with disabilities to communicate. Now we all use it. Voice to text, Siri, all of these things are things we all use and they're all um, super helpful and beneficial to quality of life for everyone. So uh, if we just open our minds and, you know, do these things, uh, everyone will see the benefit of it. Um, especially during COVID, we talk about the buttons, how many people started elbowing these buttons so that they didn't have to open doors because they weren't sure about COVID. So it's a no brainer to me. I don't understand how we are still having this conversation in 2022, even though five years ago, I would have, I had no idea what I was talking about, so. Thanks, that's so true. And it's also true that like with COVID, how, um, our needs for accessibility as, as a community changes quite, quite quickly. And some of those um, adaptations, they're, they're good for everyone. Heath, do you have anything to add to this discussion? Sure. Um, the one thing that I <clears throat> was thinking about a lot towards, especially like, um, especially when you're thinking about uh, accessible design is that, and um, uh, like everybody kind of alluded to it, but what Sam was saying was uh, that 
kind of associates with what I was up is that a lot of people who, you know, quote unquote, able bodied folk would be thinking in regular design that there's a lot of barriers for them too. Um, trying to get around with, uh, with the current design that we that we uh, regularly use. So it increases the disability for a person with a disability to get around. It's making it harder for other people to be able to get around. And it's like, um, and it's, I agree entirely. It's hilarious. Like we just had a, a a uh, couple of years where we could have pushed barriers towards a lot of things and we were adapting for it and everything. And it just has seemed like um, as the pandemic, which is still here, but um, as people are thinking about it less and less, there hasn't been really any involvement. Bits and pieces, like I, I too use the caption for when I use video conferencing and things like that. But in the physical world or analog or whatever you want to call it, um, there's still like the, um, what I like to think of as an, an ignorance of um, recognizing that we have a lot of potential for being able to make things more accessible, um, which benefits, anyways, I, I don't want to um, repeat what everybody else is saying. So that's my piece. Thanks for that. Lisa, do you want to share anything to that discussion? Uh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I, I was going to kind of just quickly combine uh, the last two um, questions here. Um, Inclusive and universal design to me is everyone has access and everyone is able to participate in their in their everyday life without um, feeling like a burden or feeling like um, they're they're the inconvenience and that's what I've known when when you're born with the, your disability definitely i find that um we're made to feel that it's our fault when when things are not accessible and it's quite it's the other way around it's it's the way the world runs and it's the way um things are just not buildings are not accessible or what what have you um my my approach to accessibility changed um, over time. And interestingly enough, so I, I was born with my disability, but I grew up in a small town and um, there is way less um, accessibility in small towns compared to a city. And um, I grew up um, uh, almost apathetic to my own needs um, and um, it, I, I adapted myself <laughs> to everything else rather than other things being adapted for me. And I grew up thinking that that was normal and then that was appropriate and that that was okay. And in, I internalize this idea of I'm I'm the problem, I'm the burden, and um, uh, so uh, I I didn't grow up with any. Basically, I didn't really grow up with any anybody that had a disability until um, I was a teenager, and I started to go to camps and started meeting other people with the same disability as me and and that kind of a thing and uh, once I started when I moved out to Edmonton um, I I started realizing how much um, how much I I let go like oh this is fine 
kind of idea. And being more involved with all sorts of uh, different people with different disabilities has opened my own eyes to the fact that so many things, so much needs to be changed. Um, and uh, so there's even, even if you're born with a disability, there is still room for growth, uh, one, 100%. Um, yeah, and I, I've I've um, learned to be a better advocate for myself instead of just sitting there and being like, you know, um, no, I'm not I'm not going to bother anybody, you know, and that kind of thing. Like, um, I, it used to be, I I wouldn't go to cer certain things just because there was stairs or whatever and that kind of thing, and I I made that my kind of my problem or whatever and and I'm I'm more more of an advocate for myself um as as I get older so yeah that's about it a lot of what you said must have resonated with the group there was a lot of nodding Keith made a comment that um when we don't design for accessibility we're actually designing barriers I know, Murray, you were nodding and you were making some noises there. So I'm going to ask you what you would like to um, reply. I was just thinking uh, on our website on, on accessfordisabilities.org, uh, we have a little video there. And the video is about the normal world versus the alternative world, I suppose. Um, the normal world in this video is all the people with disabilities. They are the ones that establish the community. So everything, everything is built for people in wheelchairs. That means that all the doors are about this high, you know, and, uh, and they're trying to discuss the, the inclusion of the normal people, the people that don't have disabilities. Now, what are we going to do about them? Because we have to redesign our, all our structures to fit these other people. And uh, I found it quite hilarious because, you know, when you, if you're an able-bodied person and you watch the video, you go, oh, <laughs> right, now I get it. <laughs> you know, and uh, like, does it really have to take that to, uh, to help us clue in? You know, um, it's funny because, you know, we just never know if uh, on our trip home today, if we're actually going to crawl into our own bed. We don't know that. Nobody knows that. Um, so yeah, you can be born with a disability and you can travel through life thinking that, man, alive, this world is just not built for me. You know, you know I'm getting tired of complaining about it. But ultimately, um, that's, not, that's not your responsibility. When architects build buildings, they need to think about everyone, not just the people, not just the people they think of. They need to think about all people. And it's interesting because the, the current... Uh, National Building Code is up for public review. And uh, I don't have the link with me, but if um, you can remind me, mm -hmm. I will send the link to you, to you by reply and then you can forward it out to everyone. But it's public review, so everyone can look at the new building code. And I really want you to check it out because uh, suddenly somebody has made, uh, they have suddenly, uh, it's dawned on someone, I should say, dawned, I would say, uh, that the National Building Code is actually, the last time any re major revisions were done to it, 1985. And they actually wrote that in the, uh, in one of the, uh, uh, their reference material for the proposed design changes that they've got. There's quite a few that, that reference the CSA B651-18, which is accessible design for the built environment. It's the higher level standard that the federal government is actually reaching up, reaching toward for all new buildings on the federal side. Um, National Building Code generally um, uh, takes into consideration about you know 70% of the people at least that's what they hope. But in a number of cases it, in this article, I think they said something like 40% um, of people are being eliminated by the current National Building Code. So if you felt like you were being left out, now you know why. And uh, I think this is about to change. And I think 
builders, uh, architects, engineers, people are starting to realize, oh, wait a second. Um, hmm, maybe it's because the Americans with Disabilities Act was established in 1990, and we're just sort of cluing in uh, at this point. It seems a little strange, but yeah, so it is coming around. And uh, I, yeah, that's it. I got to get that link out to you because you guys are going to go just like everybody else will. It's just, it blows you away. <laughs> just leave it. Really? 1985. Cool. <laughs> Murray, I'm actually involved with the uh, the group that is uh, talking about the internet, the design for uh, heritage buildings. We've had two meetings so far, and it's uh, quite a good group all across Canada, and uh, very, very interesting. So we're, there's few architects on there, so we're sort of giving the architects our perception. And all I hear from them is like, I never thought of that. Because, <laughs> you know, it would get a group together, every has a bit of a different idea. That's why it's so important. I, I'm very thankful that I did consult us, because even things like they're talking about the distillery district in Toronto is cobblestone, so cobblestone is impossible for me in a walker. So, I mean, definitely a community meeting together and sharing. Um, there's just so much that that we benefit by when we have conversations with each other and we find out what one group is doing. Um, that brings us to our next question. Can you share some social media accessibility best practices? Because we definitely get together on social media. So if you've been, you know, thinking about how social media is accessible for you, um, that's what we're going to discuss. And just to mention, I have a coworker and we were talking about accessibility and my coworker um, has had some difficulties with accessibility. She has uh, a less visible disability and um, she has faced uh, the reaction that some people um, do have with someone with a less visible disability where, oh, well, why do you have a problem with this? And uh, um, I asked her this question and she said, when making ads for events, use simple fonts. She in particular has problems with vision. And um, she says that, you know, it's very difficult for her to read them. She's asking people to stick to a sans serif font. And uh, then she said to check the, the color contrast. She says, don't use green when writing on a red background. So though it is you know timely to do that, that she says, no one can read that. <laughs> she also um, said to burn captions on videos. Um, she said that she herself didn't realize how many humans depend on closed captioning? And we've already talked about how it benefits many of us for other reasons. Um, so I'm gonna start with Michelle and ask you the question, can you share some social media accessibility best practices? So well, something I'm you would advise someone to do. For my own personal self, yes, the co closed captioning, bigger font, because I'm at the, that age where I can't read really small print anymore. And also because my disability is physical and it affects my hands um, when we're texting or on chat on Zoom, I cannot type that fast. So if People would understand. Some people can't do the real fast thumb typing thing. That's not me. It takes me a while to answer you. I'm just typing. I'm not taking my time. I'm just typing. So because lots of times I'll get message after message after message. That I haven't even answered the first one yet, you know? So for me, if people would keep in mind that some people are slower at texting or typing than other people. Thank you. So, um, Keith, 
can you share with the group any advice for making social media more accessible? You're muted. Heath. You're muted. Absolutely. I did that deliberately. Thanks for catching. Um, yeah, I was just putting forward that, like, it really depends on how you want to, uh, um, how you're approaching somebody about social media, because, like, if it's individually, like, you're seeing the person or uh, communicating with them uh, through another means like that, then listening to what their needs are and adapting accordingly. Um, when, uh, when you're gonna be working on like a workplace project uh, that's going to involve social media is asking people how their normal method of using social media is because their method is probably going to explain to you a lot better about how you should go about it, rather than just assuming that everybody approaches social media the same way, because I can guarantee you nobody does. Um, and then uh, also, I'm repeating a lot of people on this, but when you're doing things like that, you end up coming out with a lot of uh, a lot more strategies that will work better for your workplace than if you're just assuming that there's a general way that everybody goes about it and we should just use that. Sam, do you want to share anything that you would recommend for best practices for social media? Well, I see Donna's hands up, so I'll throw it to Donna first, but then yes, of course I'll weigh in. Okay, so some of the things that I think are gonna be really critical is, is to try and use as many resources as you possibly can to try and get to the diverse public that, you, that social media is trying to reach. So if you have a lot of images, then make sure to have your alternate descriptions so people can, if they can't see the image so much, they can have whatever tools they have available to them to describe what that image is, if that alt line is there. Um, the larger fonts, the simpler fonts, of course, the cleaner fonts, all of those are, are really critical. And I think, again, another big one that everybody has said is the, is the captioning. So if you've got a video there, I mean, I think, I went to a training session and they said the stats are most people don't even listen to the sound. So they're actually reading the captions. So make sure to have those captions when, you know, so you're just opening up the door for so many other people who want to try and, and be involved as much as they can. Sam, thank you for throwing it to me. No problem. Um, yeah, I think everyone's reiterated um, some really key points. I definitely think captioning and alt text and image descriptions or video descriptions are definitely best practices. Um, using plain language, keeping things simple, that's just good marketing, honestly. Um, I think that there's obviously high, contract, high contrast is valuable. Um, and I think I might have a blog on this. I didn't, I was looking for it. I might have written it and never posted it. So if I do, I'll send the link. And once I post it, you might've reminded me. Um, but I also see Tara's holding her hand up. So I'll throw it to Tara too. Thank you. Sorry, I seem to have lost the ability to raise my virtual hand. Um, uh, basically, uh, captioning has been mentioned, but um, specifically, if you're making a, uh, whether it's a film, an advertisement, anything for virtual entertainment or information, etc., please embed the captioning because relying on the free example Zoom captioning 
it's not going to be working at all. So unless you actually embed the captioning in the video, it won't have captioning 90% of the time. So please, please think about that and include the hard of hearing in depth. Thank you. Thank you for that, Tara. Murray, Murray has a question. He says, how do you do that? That's a very deep question. Um, <laughs> I've, I've only ever made one film, so I'm not a professional. So um, you actually have to type it out and include it in the video as part of the file of the video. So um, I'm... Um, Heath is more skilled at that, that. I'll let him answer it. So if it's not a live video, what I'll what I normally do is I use uh, some of the alternative um, uh, captioning softwares to uh, record, especially if it's a long thing. And then I myself will go in, into taking time and edit it so that the language is all in, uh, correct, because even the best ones will get the odd words wrong and stuff, and that's fine. And then if you're using a live one, is um, there's two possibilities. If you have a quick typer, not necessarily to completely rely on them to type everything accordingly when people are talking, because sometimes that's a little bit too difficult, but um, there, there are options i even think on like things like zoom and whatnot um in the in their inherent captioning i think they do give you an opportunity um to be able to manually rewrite things um if you catch them fast enough but again if it's a full conversation going on and things go really quick it can be really difficult to do that but I can see that other people have amazing suggestions. So I'm going to leave it to them. I see Donna's hand. I think I think her hand went up first. I think also. And then Sam. Sorry? Oh. <laughs> I think uh, one of the things also with that training that I mentioned earlier is there's also um, actual companies out there that can transcribe it for you properly and and so that like tara said you're not getting that hodgepodge of what was said but you're getting an actual transcription and it can then be inserted into the video as well but again this is an area that i'm not that familiar with only what i've learned so sam take it away <laughs> I was going to say, there's lots of, yeah, there's definitely lots of ways. As for burning it on, I am not the expert on that, but I do have a lot of hacks to be, I'm lazy. Um, so I, like, for example, we have a podcast and we run the transcript. Um, so if you have Microsoft 365, there's a transcribe thing. And then of course, the thing is, if you use any of these automatic tools to kind of get the base down, you want to go over the video and make sure it's right. Like the automatic tools are just a way to kind of get it all in the beginning and then you need to make sure that it's right. I think YouTube has that option. I don't know if they've removed it. They removed the community suggestions. People used to be able to say, hey, this captioning's wrong. Um, they removed that. But when you actually upload your own YouTube videos, you can pick their automatic captioning and then you're able to change the transcript. For live events, um, we hire cart captioners. So they're basically, they take stenographer training essentially, and then they take additional training to um, learn how to do cart. They're also not perfect because they're human. So to air is human, um, but they are trained. And uh, so they can type really, really quickly. Um, I just wanted to make a comment about burned captions versus open captions. Um, I have also heard, and this is not from experience that for some people they prefer open captions because like the distraction. So if it's like a, um, like a learning disability or something like that, they might find the captioning um, distracting. So being maybe not burned, but being able to turn them off. I think what Tara really is trying to say is having them available and making sure they're accurate is what I'm hoping is. Yeah. But the option providing options is always like the best. If use them, if you need them, turn them off. If you don't, I have this conversation about lighting a lot because a lot of disabilities have conflicting lighting needs. Some people need really highlights. Some people are really 
um, sensitive to highlight, so having dimmable switches. So um, I think being able to be flexible and adaptable is I think the easiest way. And then you can um, adhere to or appeal to more people. Thank you. If anyone wants to add anything to that discussion, if you could just raise your hand, otherwise we'll go on to the next question because um, this is so good, but we we're limited in time. So um, no raised hands. So we're moving on. The next question is what can be done to ensure that people with disabilities have an equal opportunity to apply for jobs? compared to someone who is not disabled. So raise your hand who wants to start with this question. What can be done to ensure that people with disabilities have an equal opportunity to apply for jobs? Murray, are you gonna start on this nope. one? No, nope, Murray's nope. passing. Never hired anybody and I, <laughs> I, uh, I just actually did a resume for myself here. I'm 63 now. So yeah, I don't I don't qualify <laughs> for this question. <laughs> Michelle, is there anything you can think of? Uh, well, when I I was reading this question, the first thing that popped into my mind, and please anybody add anything, please, <laughs> um, is that we have to make sure people with disabilities, our voices are being heard. And to keep in mind, and this really bothers me sometimes, is that people with disabilities aren't the exception. We're part of society. We're over 22% of the, the population. So why not include us in every employment aspect? Like not just the programs that are run. Why not just hire us? Why do we have to go through programs all the time? You know, we're ha most of us here have post-secondary education and lots of work experience, whether it's volunteer or working. So why not just include us? Why do we have to go through all these other processes to get hired? Um, yeah, that's what I thought of when I read that. And we need to be heard. It's, yeah. Anyone else? <laughs> Actually, you know, your comment, I get, the hand started going up. So I think Donna has a comment and then Heath. Well, I have, I have quite a few comments on this one, actually. Um, I, I have been fortunate to, to have worked full time up until about, well, right before COVID. I just find that it's important that employers, an example, before I even get into that, is do you disclose? As a person with a disability, do you disclose? And if you don't, in your resume at least, then you get an interview and you don't get the job there's a question that's, there's a, there's a mist that's happening there because you got through the door from your resume. But when you're in person doing the interview and you may not get the job, what's the disconnect? So that's one, that's one thing is, do you disclose your disability because you don't wanna be eliminated the minute that you, you know, that you have identified yourself as a person with a disability. I guess the next thing is, I agree with Michelle. I don't think we need to jump through these nonprofit employability type hoops where we're going in and having them try to, to train us. We have post-secondary education. We, you know, maybe need some, some ability to access the resources, the people that are trying to hire and get, get our names in that way. And I think the third thing that I would say thing is education is absolutely imperative. And that is the education of the employers, the corporate, 
the companies, society, like we are capable of working and doing, and we want to do the job as much as anybody else does. And chances are very good. If we are a person with a disability, we are gonna go above and beyond to make sure that we do that job in the best possible way we can, because we're concerned that we may not be able to keep that job. The first thing that maybe someone is seen as a, as a flaw could be our exit. So we're going to be very careful. I guess those are, those are some really deep and probably triggering things to discuss, but I would say that's, those are things that, that are imperative, is especially the education. It's not hard to get a, a reader or some tools to assist somebody at their job. And it's not necessarily exorbitant pricing or it's not exorbitant pricing to shovel a walk so someone can, can get into that building to work. So those are all really important things. And those have to come from the education, I, I think. Just- I, I just have to add before I let Heath um, uh, take this question is that uh, it's so important to remember, Donna, that um, a workplace that is diverse has more perspective and it has more unique ways of solving problems. And, you know, it makes the workspace, I think, um, stronger to have that diversity too someone with a different perspective. So um, many of us actually, just one last thing, many of us who are living with a disability are wonderful problem solvers. <laughs> so we are going to bring that as a strength to whoever chooses to hire us. Okay, I'm off my soapbox now. Yeah, he. Me. Yeah, thanks, Donna. Thanks for making it easy for me to follow you up now. <laughs> that was wonderful. Um, so to follow that up, uh, uh, yeah, the biggest things that I would be saying is especially like when that sort of structure is happening. And I mean, like I'm even thinking like back in October, which was Disability Employment Awareness Month. And there were some of the things that I was uh, attending with some um uh, fo- folks who, again, are like employers and things like that. And um, a lot of things need to have to change in the areas of if you're going to be doing an, an inclusive practice, it has to be honestly inclusive. And by thinking about that is actually like recognizing that um, and this is going to allude a lot off what Donna was saying, is actually like realizing that they're going to be coming to the table with strategies that are going to help your company grow and move in new directions to become better for the people that are going to be using your resources. So if you're looking at it in a mindset of saying that you're going to be inclusive, but really what you're doing is integrating a couple of folks with disabilities with menial work that's not thinking about it as an actual like getting them included in the into your workplace it's actually recognizing that like they're going to be coming to the table with strategies you're likely scarcely going to think of because again it's their reality on a daily basis whereas uh most of those nuances won't always be thought of and it can actually bring a lot more things to the table for your business. Um, Sam was even hitting a point earlier about some things in history. There are a litany, I'm going to use the word litany for this, a lot of inventions that have happened in history simply because life was really difficult for folks with disabilities trying to figure out a way to get things going. And all of a sudden, our society is moving around easier. Well, guess what? If we can continue on that path and actually encourage for there to be opportunities for, uh, again, uh, like that innovation, it'll be a lot easier for us to be able to realize on how making things like uh, accessibility in your design. I mean, like one of the stories that I remember reading about, and this was like a decade ago, 
uh, I was reading about Copenhagen happened to have for a time, one of the most accessible cities in the world for anybody to get around. And the biggest reason for that was, is that um, their downtown planners also all happen to be a lot of cyclists and love to be able to ride their bike everywhere. Well, if they're wanting to make their downtown so that it's accessible for cyclists, boom, all of a sudden your downtown is accessible for pretty much anybody to get around in. And it's just like, um, and then I, once you're making that, uh, you're making that area more accessible, more things can come to the table. And uh, I, yeah, so it's just like when you're building, uh, when you're sticking to a building structure that's only accessible for some, you're just building barriers for all. Thanks for that. Um, I just want to to move on to actually the final question because we're Sorry, um, can I add, nearing the I just, end of. I just want to add really quickly because I know oh, Donna yes, mentioned accommodations and a few people mentioned accommodations and how they don't have to be expensive. Even if they are there, we do have a grant program in Alberta called DRES, D-R-E-S. Um, and you can access, the government will provide funding for some of those accommodations. So I just wanted to make sure people knew about it because I think it's not utilized very well. Murray, do you know anything about that program? No, I always I always go to Sam whenever I need to know that sort of thing. <laughs> <clears throat> no, I don't. So after this um, program, when we're recording it, we can add some, some of these links as well to anyone. Um, so we'll get those at the end of the program. Um, the next question really, and I, I think we'll just end with this one so that everyone has some time to, to talk about this. Um, and that is, are there any ways in which things could be improved in Alberta, in Red Deer, and in the library? So I know, I don't think any of you have been to Red Deer Public Library, have you? No, Murray's here, yeah. <laughs> And he's been through the library quite, quite thoroughly. Um, so he can speak about that. So let's keep our question to be, are there any ways in which things could be proved in Alberta? And um, perhaps in our community, keeping in mind Red Deer is a community of about 100,000. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Red Deer. No? Oh, good, good. Sam, good. <laughs> Um, but, you know, Red Deer is similar to many other communities in Alberta. So if you have anything, um, your, your comments will, will fit, I am sure. So I'm going to start the conversation with Lisa. If you wouldn't mind just answering, um, are there any ways in which you think, think things could be improved? Well, I'm, I'm going to get specific here for a moment. Um, one of uh, the biggest issues people with mobility issues have, especially in the winter time, is just snow removal. And that, that, that affects any, any kind of business as, as well, right? Like you're, you're not going to get um, our business if we can't access the outside of, of the building. Um, and uh, while a lot of a lot of cities think they they do a good job of, of this, there there is still a lot of areas that um, actually get ignored. Um, and uh, whether it's 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 alleys, back alleys, back parking lots, um, and that kind of a thing. We we still um, people people with disabilities still have lives in in winter. We're not we're not holed up at home and hibernating like bears. We we have to go to the grocery store. We have to run errands. We have to go get our hair cut. You know. Um, we have to go to the library sometimes, you know? And so, um, yeah, that's, that's, 
the number one thing that I I get on a soapbox about all the all the time because um, uh, a good majority of people with disabilities have end up having quite quite a bit of depression during the winter be, just because of the lack of accessibility um, and not being able to get out in the community. So just just taking care of the outside is so important. Um, just just so that we can actually get to your business or what have you, right? So. Thank you. Um, Sam, do you want to uh, answer this question for us? Any insights into accessibility in communities, in particular, Alberta communities? Um, I mean, I think we have a, that's a pretty loaded question because <laughs> I think we've all alluded that there's a lot that still needs to be done. Um, in terms of libraries, I know that libraries are kind of leaders on this front. So um, I, I know that when I was st starting my journey of accessibility, it was the libraries that took me in. I know that alternative formats for things, like I know a lot of libraries are, are subscribed to DAISY and those types of things. So um, those are always incredible tools that other people can incorporate. Uh, look to your local library if you are looking for accessibility because they definitely are leaders. Um, in terms of Alberta, I think Murray alluded to it a little while ago, the building code would be a really great place to start. Um, and enforcing the building code and not having all these exemptions and relaxations that exist in the building code. Um, and then a huge, a really, really key piece, and I will do a little plug right now, is Alberta is one of two provinces, um, the other being PEI, that don't have any accessibility legislation or don't have a government looking at accessibility legislation. And so um, we're really, really pushing for that in Alberta. We have the federal accessibility legislation. Murray referred to Americans with Disabilities Act that got passed in 1990, so <laughs> 30 years ago. Um, and in Alberta, we have nothing that regulates our, the only recourse for, for people with disabilities is human rights complaints, and those can take up to three years um, and often don't actually resolve the problem. So we really could use some accessibility legislation here, um, some kind of recourse. If you want to join that fight, barrierfreeab.ca is where we're trying to build some of that public support. Um, it's a grassroots initiative, a bunch of volunteers. So please sign up um, and we would love to kind of push that forward. Thank you, Sam. Um, we'll add that link as well. Uh, you mentioned libraries, so I just have to interject. My role at uh, Red Deer Public Library is actually working with um, some library members who require accessible services. So you mentioned uh, daisies for anyone who's interested. Print um, should be accessible to everyone, and that doesn't mean it has to be print on paper. It can be, um, uh, well, I, I assume what we should be saying uh, is stories. Stories are important to everyone. True stories, stories that aren't true, but that delight us, and we need to make sure that all of this is accessible. So <laughs> Tatiana is just bringing in um, a daisy player. So this is an example of a DAISY player that will play a DAISY CD. Uh, Red Deer Public Library has a number of these. We have seven. We loan them out for three months at a time. In our community right now, they're in high demand. Uh, we have a number of people who may not have had a problem with print. And then as they age, they might have macular degeneration or other vision problems, and they start experiencing difficulties <laughs> So uh, a device like this that has all of the, the features, it has um, large tactile uh, buttons and it's quite simple to use. It really allows them to continue to enjoy stories um, at a time when it wasn't um, necessary anymore. Uh, other things that we've tried to do are um, include different, different groups within the library and uh, one thing that we have is actually uh, 
is a uh, is a uh, uh, it's an activity kit for um, persons who are experiencing dementia, and so either they or their caregiver can use it. So it's you know it's full of fun games and some fidget widgets and different things, so that you know there are materials in your public library no matter what you're um you're living right now and it's really important for us to make things accessible um one of the things that we want you to do is to remember that whatever community you're a part of your community library that public library should represent you it should represent you no matter who you are it should be inclusive but it also should tell you about the people in that community so when you go into that library if there are people in your community who need um, uh, something for uh, print disability, there should be items there. If you have um, experienced autism or you have a sensitivity to, to some sensory uh, stimulation in the library, there should be something there for you. There should be a way for you to, to be in that space and to to move through it and get the information that you need, get those stories you need. And if your library isn't meeting it, including and definitely including Red Deer Public Library, we, we wanna know about it because sometimes we don't know that you're in the community who you are. Come and tell us, tell us how that experience is for you going through the library. Um, uh, tell us what's working for you, what isn't working for you. And we try to, to, to fit that in. So um, if anyone has any questions about accessibility at the library, you can just um, contact myself at, um, and I'll add my email to, uh, to the links as well, or just contact the library and uh, Tatiana or I, or any of the staff would be able to um, direct you depending on what your question is. I've taken up too much of the time now. So I'm moving on to Roxanne. Well, I could talk for days about what Alberta should be doing. I mean, you know, but Sam's already said it. I mean, it's embarrassing that we don't have legislation. I mean, and it it kind of boggles my mind because I grew up in a time where the Oilers were big and we're a competitive, you know, um, province. And yet we just completely drops the ball when it comes to accessibility. And so I find personally find it embarrassing, but I wanna share a story because I, I had a big change in my life happen and I moved out to rural Alberta. My family blessed me by buying me a condo that I could live in, not accessible, of course, because that doesn't exist. It doesn't exist in Edmonton. So why would it exist in rural Alberta? But we bought what we thought was close enough that we could make some adaptations. After we bought it, not that it would have changed because it was the only option. I find out that the bathroom has a tub enclosure that cannot be, bars cannot be put on it. Like, how is that even possible? We have an aging population and I can't install a bar in my bathroom? Like, it just, I mean, it's worse than I thought. <laughs> and I'm not very positive about accessibility in Alberta. And so it just rocked me that we just paid a lot of money for me to live here and I cannot use that bathroom. You know, I mean, I will, I will find a way. Thankfully, Michelle has given me a great suggestion because she has a, a bar that suctions on that, that she has assured me works because it <laughs> terrifies me of using a bar that's only suctioned onto a wall, you know, but again, I, which brings me to the point that we all need to work together. Everything I have learned about accessibility and how to cope is from another person with a disability. It has never been from an occupational therapist. It has never been from a physiotherapist. Like we learn from each other. And so the best thing and something that libraries can do is make sure we connect and meet each other and learn from each other. So having peer groups, you know, welcome into the library, like that would be incredible. So anyways, there's my little <laughs> thoughts.
You're on you, mute. You're on mute. You're on you're mute. On mute. Wow, that was a chorus. <laughs> so I was just saying that you, you know, peer groups and libraries I thought was a good idea. And then I asked Murray to weigh in and I, I had him muted. <laughs> it's all good. Um yeah, actually, uh, an accessible Alberta Act would be awesome. I think that would be very helpful. But I, I have to say that with the uh, Accessible Canada Act, although it didn't seem to do anything much for anything other than federal properties, it is starting to make its way to a place where people are starting to listen. And uh, this year, they have decided to come up with a uh, model code standard and it, it is also out for public review, which I will also get when I get back home here and send it over. But um, both of these, uh, the fact that they are highly inclusive of persons with disabilities, and they're actually, they're really focusing on that. I know that the Alberta Barrier, uh, or the Alberta Safety Codes Council is also looking at various things, like so, uh, a lot of things I run into this summer in, in Red Deer is that uh, the city of Red Deer has a bylaw for parking stall widths of 2.7 meters or 2,700 millimeters. And um, the Alberta Barrier Free Guide says that uh, uh, an accessible parking stall only needs to be 2,400 millimeters. So people that are laying out parking lots say, oh, okay, well, we'll mark them all at 27. What do you want to do with the uh, handicap stalls? Oh, well, go to the Alberta Barrier Free Guide for that. Oh, okay. So they go there and it's 2,400. So now we have in the city of Red Deer, all the standard stalls are a foot wider than all of the handicap stalls. Yeah, I know. Oh, drop your, yeah. Everybody's <laughs> jaw drops. Yeah, I know. You would think you would think that that would be something like when you go and talk to the city about it and say, this is the situation. What do you think we should do about that? Oh, they must have went with code. Well, what do you mean they must have went with code? <laughs> why do you have a bylaw you know like we're we're so it, it, it's like um what's this girl's name? it's like lisa said <laughs> that you know um now that i got her name i can't remember what i was gonna say <laughs> <laughs> anyways <laughs> but the, the thing is is that people um they think that a person with disabilities has to make an accommodation it's you know, we've built the facility, you figure out how to get into it. That's the old way of doing things. But we're getting away from that. People are wanting, uh, human rights has become more and more of an issue um, since the 60s uh, with um, Martin Luther King Jr. in the States pushing forward the the black, uh, um, the, the, you know, abandoning racism and moving towards more inclusion. That's actually extended across into disabilities across the world. And it, actually Canada, kind of lags when it comes to the world uh, for accessibility. I think that one of the things that we're really going to see more of, and it, it's starting to gain momentum, and I, it's good to see. Actually, even in the city of Red Deer, we now have the Red Deer Accessibility Advocacy Circle, which is part of the Welcoming and Inclusion Committee, um, Education Advocacy and Collaboration. So this is something, actually, we're having our first meeting, sort of, tomorrow. Uh, morning at 10 30 um, to start heading in that direction so even in this uh, community of Red Deer we're we're gradually gaining traction and um, it's it's something that's difficult to bring architects say you know we haven't needed this before I don't see why we need it now um, but with the federal government moving towards it um, the national building code actually making actually addressing the situation i think we're going to see more and more of it and it's going to become uh easier for people to get around easier for people to uh, get into the community and enjoy the community one of the things i am a big um, um advocate of when it comes to disability is my wife has hemiplegia she is a stroke survivor uh, she's in a wheelchair she has access to her right foot and her right hand and if you've ever tried to power a wheelchair like that, a manual one, you'll find out that you can really do donuts great, but uh, going in the street line is a real challenge. Um, ramps are brutal because you keep crashing into the wrong wall, right? And um, people, they don't understand that sometimes, you know, stairs 
stairs are kind of necessary. A lot of times they think that if they put the ramp in, they're good. They don't need anything else. Ultimately, um, Accessible Alberta Act would be a wonderful thing. Uh, the fact that the communities, the welcoming and inclusion committees, I think are starting to expand out of many cities in Alberta have that. I think that's a, those are wonderful committees and uh, they need to move forward more in that direction. And um, certainly in Red Deer, we're, we're making baby steps, but we're heading in the right direction. I honestly say, and I tell everyone everywhere, you want to find out about what it's like to be an accessible uh, advocate, then maybe you should check out the Netflix Crip Camp and find out how the Americans with Disabilities Act came about and the incredibly courageous people across America that actually gave up their lives, gave up who they were so that they could make America a better place. And why can't we do that here? And uh, let's jump on the bandwagon and take it. We can do it. Next person, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, we're getting close to time. So Sorry. just quickly to go through, um, just raise your hand if you'd like to weigh on this. Michelle, we'll pass um, it on to you. Yes, I absolutely agree with everybody. What everybody has to have. But also one thing people don't think about is they themselves can be accessible. They themselves can be flexible and, and in the way that they think. And yes, maybe my store isn't accessible, but I can do this. Like you yourself as a librarian or a staff person or as a store clerk, whatever, you yourself can be accessible and listen to what needs to be done. It may not be that much at all, but open yourself up and be flexible, you know, and become accessible yourself. Jump in, Donna. <laughs> so who who would like to go next we'll try and fit in some quick comments oh thank you donna okay so basically i'm just kind of jumping off of what michelle just said as well and as much as education is is imperative for quote unquote non-disabled able-bodied people it's also just as imperative for us as people living with disabilities and we have to change our ways in some ways and that is to speak up for ourselves and to ask for these things that we need and to not be afraid to say, this isn't right. We have to change this. So I think that's that's a big thing that, that Albertans can also change, Albertans with disabilities can change. So, we have we have time for a quick comment or two. There's still one or two of you who haven't um, who haven't had anything to share. I don't want to uh, to pass by anything that you want to share. Thank you, Tara. Um, I just wanted to add on everybody else's wonderful comments. Um, Albertans and Canadians as a whole with disabilities shouldn't be afraid to speak up and speak out. They're protected by the Human Rights Act and whether it's provincial or federal. It, it is a process to file a complaint, but sometimes just mentioning it helps things happen. <laughs> so I'm just a hitch. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Ian, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I'll just quickly say what I wrote down. Uh, offer your privilege to give others out who don't have it that space. I just want to say um, every uh, meeting with a person has a chance to educate. And a quote I use a lot as one we are a voice, as two we are concerned, but as a group we become an action.
Thank you. I think, I think, has everyone had a chance to, to share? I think so. Not. Yes. Yes. Good. <laughs> um, I just want to thank you all so much for taking part in this and uh, sharing your experiences with us and um, the advice and uh, the the links and uh, the direction that we should be going as a community. I, I really appreciate uh, everything that you've been sharing with us. We will be adding some links to this video. And I want to say that this has been a good celebration. I think on the whole, you're all so positive and you, you have such a, a spirit. I think this is definitely a celebration. So thank you so much for taking part.